I'm Luke, and this is uh, Logan Poetry, uh, the art of light hacking. And so if you don't know who I am, uh, my name is Luke Armstrong, and I am an interaction designer at Don't Panic Lab, and I'm an artist, and I'm an entrepreneur. So uh, one of my projects in the entrepreneur space is called Cali Commons, and it's with my partner Molly here in the front row. And it's a creative space for uh, basically designers, artists, uh, musicians uh, to explore uh, event-based marketing, uh, collaboration, and stuff like that. Um, I also started a company called Runline, which made uh, uh, communication software for the franchise industry. Um, and I work with Brian Harvey here there on a project called Texty Press, which is all about text-based uh, communication, uh, tours, pitches, uh, that sort of thing. And uh, I'm a performance painter uh, with Molly as well, so we do live art for people to watch, and that'll come up again later. And I like to make all sorts of state, uh, strange things, so we'll talk about games and uh, art stuff that I make. And life hacking is sort of, it's personal. Uh, so it'll be personal for you, it'll be personal for me, and this is a bit about me. Um, we're gonna kinda go over some of my references, some examples, some influences, ideas, and uh, tactics, and then I'm gonna try to get through it fast enough so if someone has questions and answers, they'd like to kinda go back and forth, or if somebody wants to talk to me about uh, you know, what life hacks you do in your life, that would be fantastic. So, can everybody hear me okay? Okay. So life hacks are basically smoothing out the wrinkles of life, um, you know, finding efficiencies, uh, these sorts of things. Um, my first exposure to the term probably comes from Lifehacker, uh, the website. It's a great place to go for little bits of things that you can do to improve your life. It's a little tech-centric, but a good resource. Um, what really started it all, though, for me is before I knew what life hacking was, uh, there's a book that I encountered that uh, became kind of important for me. Uh, I found it about the year 2000 as a part of a college class I'd taken. It was an interim class. It wasn't really part of any core curriculum. Um, but basically, this book helped me understand something that I wasn't understanding before, which is that I'm not able to control anything outside of myself. And in really understanding that, I was able to let go of a lot of stress that I was feeling about trying to get the outcomes that I wanted that involved other people. Uh, another really helpful uh, resource in this space is, has been, for me, TED Talks, and I'm sure many of you listen to TED. Uh, and in particular, in 2004, I ran across this talk from uh, Malcolm Gladwell about choice, happiness, and spaghetti sauce. And in it, uh, he sort of follows the story of a consultant who's charged with finding the perfect sweetness for Pepsi. And he does some user testing. Uh, people sample the different sweetnesses of Pepsi. And he's hoping to find this elegant curve. And at the top of it will be the perfect Pepsi. And what he finds out is that the data is not good. Uh, it's all over the place. And it's unusable. And essentially, he gets fired. Uh, because he isn't able to tell them what the perfect sweetness is. And he ruminates on this for years and years and years. And eventually what he comes to is that he was thinking about it all wrong. And there isn't such thing as a perfect Pepsi. It's not a solvable problem. What is a solvable problem is there are perfect Pepsis. And he, he goes ahead and applies this uh, to spaghetti sauce. Uh, his client is Prego, and he comes up with thick and chunky tomato sauce, which uh, at this time there is none. And it's really the story of how your supermarket aisle is filled with dozens of different kinds of tomato sauce, even within the same brand. And how this applies to life hacking is, for one, what's perfect for me is not perfect for you. Uh, and for two, uh, you want to design for your personal motivations and and goals. Um, Dave Ramsey is a kind of a self-made financial 
uh, and Pfizer guy. Um, I don't love all of his ideas, but I do love one of them. It's called Debt Snowball. And the idea here is that you pay off, instead of paying off the thing with the most uh, interest rate or the thing that you owe the most on or any other thing, he says pay off the smallest thing first and then pay off the next smallest thing and the next smallest thing. And the reason why he does that is because it creates a positive proof cycle that you can in fact do it. You wouldn't be in financial trouble if you knew that you could do uh, pay off these large debts. So he starts with the motivational challenge of proving that you can be successful at winning the financial game. So it's really kind of motivationally gaming yourself. And that's like critical to figuring out how to uh, life hack appropriately for yourself. So how about a little proof of concept? So my first personal life hack that I can remember has to do with my socks. I decided that I wanted to prove that I could make an impact in my life and make it as, as tiny as possible. So I had to reorder socks. I had white socks and black socks. I had a couple gray socks and a couple brown socks. And that's like all the men's socks that were around in like 2011. Other than maybe like, you know, Bart Simpson socks or like Christmas socks or something like that. Um, so I, I went looking for a solid color. I chose yellow because I like it. It's a happy color. And I wanted to see if it would make a difference if every day, if I just woke up and put on yellow socks, if when I crossed my legs I would see yellow socks and know that I'm somehow breaking a, an unwritten rule set that exists in the world that I'm only supposed to wear white and black socks. And, you know, maybe in a, in a meeting I could cross my legs and kick out my yellow socks and throw someone else off or something like that. <laughs> and uh, it worked. Uh, I, I enjoyed it. Every morning when I put on my yellow socks, I still think, like, this is great. And I have yellow socks on, and I've worn yellow socks now for over seven years. Every single day, without exception. This gets us to kind of a nuanced difference between life hacking and personal development. So they kind of are like bookends. Life hack to me is like a little tiny thing that you can do to prove that you can make your life incrementally better. And personal development is like a long term journey. It's saying, like, I'm going to figure out what will make my life better, and then I'm going to go try to make it better. And it's really the same process to me. And that kind of uh, brings us to uh, a tool set that I use, which is Evernote. Um, I believe in taking notes across all my platforms and making it so that I can search through those notes anytime. And I, I'm kind of a digital hoarder, and I can't help but write things down. Um, and one of the things I'm exploring in this slide in 2010 is what is art? And I think it's important to kind of have a nuanced understanding of terms that other people use. The general definition is great, but the, the more you hone in on it, the more it becomes yours, and the more you can um, use that in more specific ways as you explore this kind of your world. And so in this one I've said, for me, art is not a thing. It's a type of experience, and that it can't be determined by the person who makes the thing. So to me, art is a, a label that someone would apply to something that I've done. It's a quality standard. It's saying, this is art. Uh, it's not just a painting. It's something else. It's something more. And from that place, then I can make all sorts of things art that other people don't consider art. So one of the most probably well-known life hackers is Timothy Ferris. And this is one of the first books that probably gets close to the life hacking idea that I encountered as, as it's you know, kind of defined. He would probably call it a little more like lifestyle design, but that term has sort of lost popularity. But basically, the four hour work week just says, if you can define your problems, what's really causing you problems in your life, you can solve them with little tiny hacks. And so he you know, stops answering his emails because he gives someone the, the responsibility to answer them for him pays them a dollar an hour to do that. You know, it's stuff like that. And some of the ethics involved are super questionable, but the ideas are really cool. And it's a, it's a book we're checking out for that reason. So how about a little bit more of a practical example? So 
In this one, we can see that Luke needs to lose a little weight. I have the winter pounds on there. Uh, so how would we go about maybe doing that? So for me, I set uh, a plausible path for change. So my doctor said my cholesterol was pretty high. I was feeling a little bit chubby. So I thought, well, how do I kill both these uh, birds with one stone? And I thought, well, I could cut meat, I could cut cheese, I could cut eggs. Uh, let's get rid of meat. And I thought, well, I also probably should eat a little less. So what if I increase the quality of the food that I eat? I try to eat more pungent foods, more fresh foods, so that um, my body will perceive them to be more valuable than the crap that I was eating before, the processed foods and whatnot. I also like to think about design um, as part of my job and, and development. And, and in both, we sort of have this idea of failing gracefully, uh, of failing without failing at all, uh, or failing a little bit. And so I was thinking about the food rules that I wanted to create so that I could achieve this. And I was thinking about the fact that my mom was going to ask me to Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas dinner. and. If I said that I'm a vegetarian, I would have to eat salad for like a week because like that's the concept of vegetarian that my parents have. So I decided that one way I could deal with this is I could create rules that uh, provide exceptions. And one of them was if someone else makes me food, I want to be able to eat it no matter what. And, and that's just a kind of a, a personal thing for me. Uh, I want to be gracious to the people who are providing for me. So uh, it provides a simple rule that lets me eat whatever I want, whenever I want, uh, if someone else makes it for me. Uh, the second one is I decided, you know, I'm probably going to get stressed out sometime, and I'm going to want a cheeseburger really super bad. And I think this is where a lot of people's food rules fail them. They're not flexible enough. And when you fail, you fall off the wagon instead of getting back on it. And so I just said, as many times as I want, for whatever reason I want, I can make an exception. And my thought there was that if I went from eating meat every day three times a day, to eating meat three times a week, to eating meat three times a month, then this would make a significant impact in my life, even if I had a lot of exceptions. So with those rules in mind, uh, including also elevating the quality of food that I eat, and trying to uh, eat more fresh foods and less processed foods, I went out and started to test my rules. Uh, one of the things I kind of layered in there as well, it's not really a rule, but the more you can plan and prepare, the more likely you are to succeed. So here I pre-chopped some cheese that I was about to throw in the Vitamix, which is like a $600 food grader. <laughs> uh, but it does work really well for this. And uh, it lets me uh, freeze the cheese ahead of time. And I go down to my local uh, bakery, and I get uh, sourdough pizza crusts. And I freeze those because they only last like two days. And it really makes me angry when I have to throw away an $8 pizza crust. But otherwise, I'm pretty cool with it. Um, so I have all these things already set up so that I don't have to, when I need something to eat in five minutes, it doesn't take me any longer than the frozen pizza. Uh, to get out of the freezer and put it in the oven. So it's really the same exact food, it's just different and better. And this is uh, the execution, and we get to evaluate the results. So we have uh, pungent cheese that's, you know, flavorful aged Asiago and Parmesan and uh, Romano. We have uh, fresh basil and tomatoes that come from my CSA, which get delivered every week, so I don't have to do that. And uh, I just pulled all this stuff off the counter and out of the freezer and ended up with the pizza in the same amount of time or less that is smaller proportion, but equally as flavorful. And it helped me to lose about 40 or 50 pounds and keep it off for now four or five years. So for me, this is a success. And I can layer in things that help me uh, extend this by maybe adding something like exercise. So. Uh, I started experimenting with yoga. Um, I tried running, I tried walking, I tried uh, lifting weights. All these things uh, are great for some people, but I kept failing at continuing them. When I would run, I would turn into sprinting, and then I would throw up. 
Uh, when I was walking, I would get distracted by the things I was walking by and walk in and eat a burrito instead. Uh, when I was lifting weight, I was like, oh my god, all these sweaty dudes are running around me. So yoga works for me because I don't need to be around people. I can learn how to do it, and I can do it each day. And so at the height of my yoga practice, I was practicing about an hour a day, every single day, for about a year. And I probably practice two to three times a week at about an hour a piece now. And it combines uh, both exercise and meditation kind of in one thing. And it's very clearing for me and it works for me. So next I'd like to talk a little bit about kind of the idea of setting a default behavior. So there's a TED talk that I heard from Dan Ariely uh, who wrote this book, uh, Predictably Irrational. Uh, that really made me start thinking about behavior in a new way. Uh, he would call himself a behavior economic, uh, behavioral economist, whatever, you know what I mean, uh, economist, that's right. And um, some of the things that he studies are like things like uh, what happens if your organ donor form is checked by default. And it turns out that it makes a huge difference, um, something like, uh, 80% of why people decide to be organ donors or not be organ donors is whether the thing is checked to start with. And when you start to think about how default behaviors influence everything else, it kind of makes you keep that in the back of your head and think about it all the time. So what defaults are you setting for yourself? Uh, and with that in mind, we're going to talk about what I would call a transformational project, which is um, uh, Cali Commons. And, and I'm going to start by giving a little bit more background on who Molly and I are and uh, kind of this idea of painting uh, together. So uh, it's a foundation of our relationship. We, we really early on, we painted a painting together and it catalyzed how, how we felt about each other. And uh, so we decided really early that we wanted to share that. And so we started doing these conversations that you can watch, uh, cooperation without words, we just do paintings and people sit and watch and uh, we interact and we don't speak about that. Um, it's kind of art as both an experience and an artifact simultaneously and we're trying to connect with people's imaginations directly uh, to, to make them wonder, could I, could, could I do this? Uh, could I do this with my partner? Um, and it's, it's very rule based and I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, but it's very, uh, it's not nearly as scary as it seems. So we were working uh, and living in this house, and we had a uh, Benson studio, uh, and we're, our life was feeling very chaotic. We were going to all these places, doing all these things, and we decided maybe it would be better if it was all sort of co-located, if it was one thing. We started looking around, and we found uh, this building. And we thought, well, maybe we could align all the resources and motivations that we have. And we can sort of think about it like floors of our lives. And so the top floor is our living space. The main floor is the space that we interact with the public. So we do performances, we do uh, gallery shows, that sort of thing. And then we have workspace in the basement. And so each time we walk down the floor, we know what we're doing, we know what space we're in, and it sort of focuses our lives in one unified direction. This is Molly. Uh, she sort of uh, arrived at our blank canvas, and, and we're sort of like redesigning our lives around the fact that we had a 2,600 square foot house, now we have a 3,600 square foot building, but the floors are divided differently. So we only have like 1,300 square feet to live in. So for our living space, we have to get rid of stuff. But for our, uh, our performance space, we don't have any equipment. And for our, our shop, we have suddenly twice as much space. What do we do with all this stuff? And so it kind of started making us think about how we might be able to share some of these resources and maybe share some of the burdens of these resources. Um, so we started thinking about Cali Commons as a beacon, a place to attract people so that we could stay in one place and have people come to us rather than finding some sort of perfect space that magically exists somewhere. We decided to use recurring events to sort of build an audience and devise to invite the public to participate, to learn about what we're doing, and to kind of show people what an iterative space looks like. 
and what it's like to experience something that's constantly in flux. We invited other artists to come participate uh, so that they could experience the joy of collaboration and sharing that with other people, with the public, making that visible, making it visible to other artists because it's not a common thing. But we've somehow convinced uh, dozens of artists to participate in, in collaborative paintings with people they don't know uh, in a really confined amount of time in a process that they're not familiar with. And, and as you can see, they generally enjoy it. You know, they're happy about this. So I, I spoke a little bit about the fact that Molly and I have rules. So this is us using um, this moving wall and easel mount uh, to, to make a painting. And, and we're capturing this video passively on a Nest Cam and uh, rolling it up into a time lapse that we can share. Uh, we're painting uh, based upon some simple rules. One is no talking. The other is no symbols. Um, and really, beyond that, it's just we're done when we agree we're done, and that's the only thing we, we talk about. Are we done yet? We take turns. We try to improve what we see. Um, we're not worried about covering things up, but we don't have any sort of emotionality about it because we don't use symbols. There's nothing emotional that can happen. I'm kind of going to let it play out for a second here. But basically, yeah, you get the idea. Up, back up at the apartment level, I'm starting to notice that there's something different about being above the ground floor, which is something I never really paid any attention to before. But uh, as I sat out on the porch, I started to notice that the sunset was different at the top of this hill uh, and the top floor of this building. Um, and I had this freedom uh, since I worked for myself in this vertically integrated space. Uh, and I thought, I ought to be taking advantage of this. Um, I'm just working in the basement, you know, all day, every day. So what if I set my alarm to ring for sunrise and ring for sunset? And what if I always stopped, and no matter what was happening in my life, to kind of <coughs> check in with the world in its natural cycles? I call that stretching the rubber band. Because I had all these people who were yelling at me about stuff, but that would never stop. So uh, taking a moment for myself was important. While doing that, I sort of took this opportunity uh, to notice something. And I'd been experimenting with these mindful masks that you can buy online. They're about $10. Um, they're kind of like a sleep mask, except you can open your eyes inside them. It has little pockets for them, so it sits off your face a bit. And I've been doing that regularly for maybe a year. And I was sitting out on the porch watching the sunrise. Well, actually, I was watching the sunset on the porch. And I was thinking about when I was a kid and poking a hole in a, card, a piece of cardboard so I could watch a solar eclipse. And I was like, I wonder what would happen if I poked some holes in those mindful masks. I wonder if it would look like a fly, or I don't really know. So I grabbed the needle and I started poking holes in one of the mindfolds, and I sort of got to this thing where I was able to create both a color field and sort of these little bubble universes that filtered out part of the complexity of the world, let me have a reference point in the world, but also um, made it feel like I wasn't even kind of there. So it creates this weird layer of abstraction, and this is me uh, taking them on the road. I think I'm in Washington, D.C., and I'm looking out the window of my hotel and sort of meditating and watching people walk by. And I, I don't feel like they're staring at me uh, uh, like I would if I was just sitting there uh, with this weird mask on. <laughs> at this time, I'm also thinking a great deal about um, how to be more happy in my life with dealing with more and more stress and sort of like pushing on this a little bit. And there's this talk from uh, David uh, Stendhal-Rast, who uh, really drives home a point. It's a very simple talk, but it's basically you don't need to be uh, you don't need to be looking for happiness. You just need to be grateful. If you're grateful, you will be happy. Uh, there's always opportunities. There's always new things, and there's ways to see the world and see the things that happen in a way that make you feel good about it, no matter what. And so it's sort of creating a virtuous cycle uh, of appreciation. Uh, 
in the, in the world. And, and while I was kind of exploring this simultaneously, I have these uh, ideas about um, parts of your life. So I divided the world, or the, my life uh, span into thirds. It was pretty arbitrary, but the idea was that you spend about a third of your life learning predominantly, you spend a, a third of your life predominantly doing, and you spend a third of your life, uh, what you have left, uh, sharing those experiences and those things that you learned with the world. And so based upon this, I decided that as I was approaching my 33 and a third birthday, that I would take this big trip to Peru, leave my companies with uh, hopefully capable hands, Molly, and my uh, contractors at Redmind actually, I didn't even have any full-time employees, and I would just see if they could run it for 30 days. Well, essentially I went off the grid uh, to Peru. So this is me and um, Machu Picchu, and I picked Peru partly to get out of my comfort zone. I, I don't speak Spanish. Uh, I'm bouncing around from hostel to hostel. We do not have a plan, exactly. Uh, and it, it really delivered all that and more for me. I also took a, a kind of a, uh, a bit of a, an opportunity to visit with some, some local shaman, and, um, and I found some insight that I was looking for. Um, that's a, a much longer story uh, that I'm happy to tell, but probably not going to fit in today's talk. Um, so I sat there and I was reflecting and, and, and being secluded and, and being quiet. And, and uh, meanwhile, I'm worried that the whole world is on fire. Uh, but I get back and it's fine. And we proceed to try to start small fires that would grow uh, into some sort of um, you know, movement towards these kind of local creative efforts and the intermingling of these creative forces. And so to do that, we sort of, in this last season, we've boosted the, the number of events that we've had. Um, we did like, what is it, so eight in, in, uh, in May and probably about the same amount in June. And it's really just becoming about empowering other people to put on these sort of creative things. Um, this is maybe one of my favorite books. Uh, it's really short read, and you don't have to read it front to back. Um, Jason Fried from 37 Signals and his partner is the guy that you know, made uh, Ruby on Rails. Uh, he made this book, and I can summarize the most important part of it, which is essentially you make byproducts in everything that you do, and if you take a, a few moments to think about what those byproducts are, you can put them to use in other areas that you didn't think about before. And in a lot of ways, that's what Cali Commons is. It's a place for ideas to find new lives. And so we have this, you know, uh, A is the, the Nest Camps. It's, it's live, live streaming if you want it to be. Uh, it's uh, easily, you know, easily creates time lapse passively so people don't even notice the cameras. It's not like somebody's setting a thing up. Um, We've got the moving wall with the easels on it, um, which on the back of it has a game, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, we've got these swappable frames that are laser cut out from a local manufacturer. We've got uh, a kegerator that we've ref retrofitted to, uh, to sort of do a forced carbonated teas and coffees and things that don't have sugar in them uh, and don't have alcohol in them because a lot of creative folks can't have that stuff around. So, um, uh, and, and then the last thing here is that we have a, like a little kiosk with an iPad in it, and that's showing our community feed on our digital network. Um, so on the back side of the wall here we have uh, uh, a game that I made out of my waterbed. When I first moved to town I had a waterbed. I got tired of carrying it around, but the wood seemed valuable, so I started to make a game, and it, it kind of followed us from place to place, and it kept getting better and better. It has a screen, some arcade buttons, uh, it's running uh, uh, an arcade controller that's uh, connected to a PC that boots a Linux booter that basically boots up a website that runs my scorekeeping application. Um, but before that, I had the hacked apart a laptop and I had kind of hooked it up that way. Um, but before that, the laptop was actually part of an arcade project where uh, I wanted to build a suitcase arcade so I could take my NES experiences anywhere I went and my childhood could come with me. Um, and all that is about kind of repurposing things 
um, upcycle, you know, reworking these ideas into something better and better and better and more shareable. Um, so Kelly Commons is sort of supposed to sit at this nexus of physical and digital, and these frames are becoming an important part of that. They started as a way to present artwork for fairly cheap. They were about um, seven dollars a piece to produce. And they can be even cheaper if you produce them out of different materials. Um, and initially, it was one-sided, like the arts on one side. But now we're getting into presenting ideas on one side and artwork on the other side, kind of like a. Uh, an, Art, like a cover for like an album, almost. So how does it work, right, the digital physical thing? So we have access to Idea Marketplace for the artists, we have access to space to hold events, um, presentations, that sort of thing. We give access to tools, we have computers, we have software that people can't easily uh, access, like Adobe products. And then we pair that with uh, Runmine's uh, software, which basically lets each of us have our own website that keeps our own contacts and lets us send out email marketing materials, capture reviews, put up coupons, sell stuff in our online stores. But then it wraps it all up and bundles it and, and, and puts it in one community feed. Um, so we can speak together with a single voice and market each other more effectively. But we still get our own private spaces. So I can post my ideas in my digital space and in my physical space. Um, this idea in particular is uh, an idea I came up with that sort of is an iteration on the lean process. Uh, as a designer, sometimes I get frustrated by the lean process. And so I was trying to describe it to people what, what I would rather have. And so this is sort of an infinite process to me of making and reflecting. And, um, Basically, it's imagine, define, design, build, use, notice, clarify, prioritize, and then you repeat and repeat and repeat. And each time you're sort of refining the product, and it doesn't really matter what the product is, because it can be applied to pretty much anything. Uh, I mentioned that the, the artwork has multiple sides. It also has multiple forms. This is uh, it with a clear frame. Uh, I designed these early on, but we decided not to go with them because it didn't work well with the wood. But as I started playing around with them, it became an inspiration for an art project that would, that would use the clear frames as layering to produce three-dimensional uh, um, backlit, these are backlit by LED lights uh, that can dance with music, and then that creates movement inside the artwork as layers turn on and off due to the color interactions uh, with the actual physical planes. Um, before that, though, uh, I had this kind of version that had two pegs. And, um, and then I had started building those off the surface uh, physically. And you can, if you want to see these things later, they're up here. So like this. And I've been experimenting a lot with how to create products out of art um, and processes that would drive down costs and formalize uh, production routines, but while preserving the creativity involved in them. So um, there's a, uh, a grid that's being used in these cards that's also being used in the big painting. And you can see the grid in the top right. Uh, the, the painting is made on the, on the bottom right, but that's also behind the painting, the big one in the center. Um, so it's really just informing the composition, but it's it's uh, fairly passive in that. Uh, a lot of this stuff leverages lasers, so I also did a laser cut and engraved puzzle. Um, I did a whole pack of cards with my five favorite sort of concepts that I was working on. The idea was that it would sort of be a bookmark for what I was thinking about. Um, this one's called Artist for Everyone. Um, I, I decided to package those and do them on a repeated basis and trying to create some sort of ritual around the consumption of art and to make it more personal and to make the real, tangible, most important things the cheapest thing that I possibly sell. Because what I really want is for people to interact with my ideas. Um, there's some card packs up here too later. If you want to look through those, you can. There's some extras, you can even take one. Um, here's what the packs look like. You know, all this stuff, it starts like on the back of a napkin. 
Uh, this is the next version, hopefully, uh, artisan experience, and we're talking about noticing and understanding and reflecting, uh, experimenting and, and, and ritualizing the whole thing. We're also playing with uh, kind of concepts that sometimes people don't have to actively give you permission to do things. So I've been working on a t-shirt project for three years where I wear the same shirt every day for a year. Um, maybe you've noticed, maybe you haven't. Um, but the first version started with a screen printer, a commercial screen printer, printing a black uh, ink design that I gave them. Uh, and then I'm using a photoreactive ink on top of it uh, and printing uh, the, the pattern that would fill it in. Um, I have an example up here as well. Um, and the idea here is to essentially incept people that I meet into remembering me uh, by repeatedly th them seeing me with the same symbol on, even if they don't know what it means, it sort of blinks in their memory. That's the idea. And the year, be uh, the year after that, uh, I, I tried to make it a little more participatory, and I switched to dark colored shirts with light color printing so that people could use markers to color in the light colors while uh, letting the dark sort of mask out um, so you don't have to worry about staying in the lines or whatever. And then each one would have a different kind of colorful look. Um, along with that, I, I launched a, a simple game that's free. It's called changepaces.com. And basically, it's exploring uh, this idea of um, taking back time and understanding how uh, the, the, the rate at which you feel like you're operating at and the rate at which you actually are operating are not connected. So you may feel like you're working super fast, but probably you're not working any faster at all. So if you could practice uh, slowing down and speeding up, maybe you would have control over uh, the way time feels. Here's uh, last year's shirt and this year's shirt kind of side by side. And in this year's, I really didn't do a lot different. Um, I, I decided I would experiment with the lengths of sleeves and hoods and kind of which format of shirt I like best. And um, the previous year uh, contained my brain scan. Uh, this year uh, includes my image upside down, looking into a bucket where my brain is disintegrating. Uh, and it's sort of like uh, rings on a tree. It's sort of like each year I sort of expound upon the previous generation of shirt. Uh, I take some elements of it and add to them, and I take some away. Uh, I'm pretty fascinated with time. Um, another project I worked on last year is called Elastic Time. You can find it at elastictime.me. Essentially, the idea here is uh, we only have 24 hours in a day, uh, but how, is hours the most useful time increment for us? I don't know. It, we, we feel like, I feel like time is so static, and it's static because we live in a logistic era where, uh, a logistically driven era where um, things arriving on time is critical, but that's actually super recent. Right? Like we have the internet, and then we have railroads. And before that, we didn't have any use for that. Uh, time was driven individually at each city level, set probably according to the sun, and it was different in every city, village, all over the world. And before clocks, uh, we just looked up in the sky and we used the sundial. So getting back to that and, and this whole sunrise, sunset thing, I was wondering, what if we uh, made it so the time was elastic? What if I had 40 or 50 or 100 moments of time in a day that I could access more easily than an hour, right? So I divided a day into 50, 50 moments, nine into 50 moments, and aligned them pol polar, uh, polar. I aligned them on the poles of the sunrise and sunset. So based on where you are in the world, your time is individual to you. It subdivides your day into 50 moments that you can uh, access, and the idea was that you could potentially tie this into a calendaring system and have your calendaring system interpret your uh, event notifications into your existing time frame. Uh, to take this even further, uh, I tried to layer in the idea of the elastic schedule. I'm working on multiple projects simultaneously, so how do I make sure that I make progress in all of them? Well, I tried to use a physical trigger, uh, eating, as a subdivider of my day. So I eat three times a day. So each time I eat, I switch my focus. And then I subdivide the week into uh, two pieces in this case, but it's subdividable however many times you want. 
And this gives me eight focuses that I can pursue in my life and my work week. Um, and I said that I would do personal things before breakfast and after dinner and uh, between uh, uh, breakfast and lunch and lunch and dinner, I would work on some project every day of the week. I put my more fun projects on the weekend and I put my more serious projects on the, and during the week and I gave them a four day stack versus a three day stack. But I think this is dividable in many ways. And I think as uh, our our culture detaches from any time or place that's specific, um, we could detach from the normal work week completely. The seven day cycle is not per particularly useful either. Uh, it's sort of arbitrary and it's sort of left over from a different time. So with that, I guess that's my kind of overview of life hacking. Uh, there's only uh, one thing to do and that's to jump in and, and get started if you're not already. Um, and you can probably do whatever you want to do uh, once you get started. So, I'm Luke, um, I work here at Don't Panic, and if you want to talk to me about life hacking or other things, you can find me at uh, larmstrong at don'tpaniclabs.com, or you can find me in this public probably.